In our first video on the jet engine series, uh, we designed and constructed a hybrid electric ducted fan afterburner jet engine and then went ahead outside and tested it. And the results were pretty successful. And it produced over 10 pounds of thrust. And we learned a great deal, which we've decided to then incorporate into version 2.0. We got a number of comments though on the video by people who were wondering about the layout of the individual components, how they interacted. So before I assemble all of these parts into a way that you can't see them, I thought I'd run through the old engine and then show you some of the changes that we've made in the new engine. To begin with, the engine was based on a single stage axial EDF electric ducted fan made by JP Hobby. This is a 12S or about 45 volt, 5000 watt, 90 millimeter diameter fan that fit in the front of the engine compartment here. Behind this, the high velocity air was then accelerated by this cone to a small annular gap where the abrupt change in the profile of the cone caused a stagnation area behind it, allowing for a stable burn to be supported by a 400,000 BTU propane powered weed burner. This weed burner provided the stable heat that then allowed for two input nozzles here to add an additional million BTU of fuel, propane, into the system to increase the temperature so that we could be running a exhaust temperature around 1500 degrees centigrade. Behind there, although I don't show you right now, were some tungsten strips that were placed in here to increase the turbulence and the mixing and provide for good burning. And then the high temperature exhaust moved down the end of the tube through this area here to these small angled blocks of steel that were welded on the end and supported these strips that could be adjusted in and out in order to provide an optimal cross-sectional area to give us the maximum thrust from the fan with the process of the heating. An interesting thing that we learned is that you really don't need 400,000 BTU just to get the fuel burning and maintain a stable burn. So we've decided to reduce the size of this substantially. The Achilles heel though with this kind of an engine is the low compression ratio that is achieved with a single stage axial fan. As powerful as this is, it doesn't achieve a very high compression ratio. And the thermodynamically interesting thing is that the higher the compression ratio that you reach, or the higher the velocity, which are two different ways of looking at the same problem, the higher the compression ratio, the more efficiently you can extract kinetic energy from the burning process and produce thrust. So if you can get a higher compression ratio for the same amount of burnt fuel, you will get more thrust. So what we need to really do is improve the compression ratio of this engine. And that's what we did when we went to version 2.0. Let me show you what we've done to improve on this engine and what I'm going to be assembling over the next day or so. Now in the second version of this engine, we've incorporated some of these improvements. And the main one is that we've gone to a second stage turbo compressor. The fans, the EDFs, are very similar to each other. The 12S 90mm JP Hobby fans. There's one difference though. The first fan operates in a clockwise direction and the second fan operates in a counterclockwise direction. In a typical turbojet engine, the turbo compressor unit rotates as one whole component. And because all of the blades are operating in the same direction, you would produce a very high velocity tornado, which is not a very efficient way for producing compression. So in those types of engines, what they do is they incorporate what are called stator blades between the stages. That allows them to redirect the flow to optimize the angle of attack for each subsequent stage to improve compression. One of the advantages of these independent electric drives is we can actually reverse the direction of the blade rotation to take advantage of the fact that we can improve the angle of attack in the second stage and improve compression. So we don't have stators between these two stages. In any case, similar to the previous engine, 
we have this acceleration cone, which provides a higher velocity of air as it uh, gets near the edge here in the small annular gap between the inside diameter of the tube, and this rather stagnant area where the air is allowed to compress and produce the turbulence that's necessary to get good mixing. You'll notice also that this burner, instead of 400,000 BTU, is a 20,000 BTU propane burner that acts to place some heat into the fuel that's going to be sprayed into this flame tube. It also helps to atomize and add some additional flow through there, which Im improves the mixing and the eventual burning of the fuel. And this flame tube is held on the actual flame nozzles that are mounted on this ring that sits on the outside diameter of the tube. There are four little entrance ports. Each of these little nozzles, which you see here, have tiny little ports and allow us to spray fuel from anywhere from about 100 to 200 PSI into this tube. And then the flame entering here with some fresh air allows the uh, fuel in here to be heated, preheated, atomized, and partially burnt but burnt at a very, very rich condition so that until the air and fuel mixture reaches the end of the tube, there's not a lot of burning that occurs, but as soon as it reaches the end of this tube, it explodes in a very hot, well-mixed flame front that will then mix well with the cool air that's passing around it to produce the increased temperature in the exhaust. In order to support the other end of the tube, we have these tungsten rods that extend through and hold the tube in the center of the main tube to keep it away from the edges of the walls. In addition, one of the things you'll notice about this tube is that it's substantially smaller in diameter than the previous tube. By learning about what kind of pressure ratios or cross-sectional ratios we needed, we were able to produce a tube that has the correct exhaust nozzle diameter without necessarily needing the complexity of the sliders that we had before, simplifying things and making them a lot lighter. The flame as it exits here though, you'll see all of the thermal damage that occurred due to the 1500 degrees centigrade air and fuel that were blending and burning at the end of the tube. And actually near some of those posts, there's some distortion that occurred in the tube due to this high temperature. So one of the things that we decided to do is rather than try to get a very, very high tech type of tube or a ceramic tube, we decided to incorporate a, a secondary layer of cooling fluid to provide cooling to the outside of the tube. So if you take a look at this second ring, this ring actually has little grooves mounted here and input ports on each side of it, if you can get a good view of that. The tube here is then going to have these 28 gauge stainless steel tubes clamped around the outside and these Secondary tubes will be supported away from the surface of the main tube with a gap of about two millimeters. High pressure water will be pumped into the secondary ring and forced down the outer uh, gap between the two tubes. It will produce superheated steam, potentially increase the thrust of the engine, but also keep the outside of the tube cool, so we hopefully won't get the distortion and the damage. Nevertheless, to prevent oxidation from occurring inside of the tube, one of the things that we also did is we still had the inside of the tube coated with some zirconium oxide, which is a 4,000 degree ceramic coating that will help to prevent oxidation damage to the tube. And the steam should hopefully provide some cooling to the tube so, again, we don't get the distortion. Now, we had originally thought that an optimal way to try to get the maximum compression out of the engine was to do what hot rodders do, or people with uh, turbochargers and intercoolers. The plan was to try to introduce some fuel or fluid prior to the uh, compression process in the combustion chamber, and therefore increase the density and potentially the multiplier effect for the thrust for the fans. Nevertheless, these fans don't produce enough compression ratio to produce a sufficient amount of heating that we get much of a gain from the cooling process of, of an intercooler injection. So we, we decided not to go that way. What we did do is something kind of unusual, and that's what I want to show you at the front of this engine. If you notice, there are these small nozzles that we've mounted here. Each nozzle is attached to a very small high pressure diffusion sprayer and attached to each of these two inputs is a tank 
of liquid propane. And the intention is to blow liquid propane directly through the three-phase motors that are driving this unit. Interesting thing about that is that copper decreases its resistance to electrical flow by about a half a percent for every degree centigrade you cool the copper. The propane, the liquid propane, will vaporize at minus 49 degrees centigrade. As a result, by supercooling the motors for this, this fan, we can probably run it up to seven or 8,000 watts and keep it cool as well as more efficient and give us a much higher compression ratio. The amount of propane necessary to do that though is quite small and it's still well below the flammability limit of propane in the air that's coming in here. So it's not gonna burn here. It's just gonna be cooling the motors and then eventually will combine with the air here and be burnt later on in the combustion compartment. The only other thing that I would want to sort of demonstrate is that if you look down here, you'll see what looks like a paper towel tube. This is a zirconium oxide ceramic tube. And one of the things that we may do if this is very successful is convert from a propane injection system to a nitrous oxide injection system. Colder yet, and it'll allow us to increase the oxygen concentration, allowing us to increase the temperature. And at that point, this may be necessary instead of a stainless steel tube if we get up to temperatures of 2,000, 2,500 degrees centigrade. We'll see if the tube will stand that. The final thing that I would show you over here is our control system. We've got some batteries here and some control mechanics that should allow us to get these motors up to 16S and potentially 7,000 watts each. Hopefully this will give us the kind of thrust that we're looking for in a practical engine. So what I'm gonna be doing tonight is I'm gonna be assembling this so you won't be able to see the insides of this anymore. Then we'll put it on our sled. We've got some much more powerful springs we're gonna demonstrate what this, uh, how this engine works compared to the old one. And then we'll get some good pictures. We'll do some daytime pictures with just the fans running so you can see what the electrical performance is. We'll do some pictures at night so you get kind of an idea of what it looks like, the plume, the heat. And we'll try to get some FLIR pictures too so that you can see sort of the heat distribution as well as the extent of the plume and the high temperature exhaust that's coming out of the engine. So this is very exciting. I can't wait to uh, start screwing things together because it's all ready to go. So hopefully in a very short time, we'll produce the video that shows you how this works outside. But uh, thanks for watching for just this update. And hopefully this was a little bit more clear than the previous video about how we're laying things out. Once again, please subscribe because it really helps us out. But in any case, thanks a lot for watching and you have a wonderful evening.